Okay, looks like we're live. Hi everyone, thanks for joining us again for the weekly Vintage Lens conversation. Today I have a very exciting guest, a good friend and a very talented DP, Nathan Thompson, who is also a massive Vintage Lens nerd. So I think it's gonna be a very fun conversation. So welcome Nathan, thanks for joining me. Hey Alan, great to be here, man. How are you feeling today? I'm feeling really good uh, because you are such a big part of why I ever discovered vintage lenses uh, way back in what, probably, goodness, like 2013 or 2014, like from the beginning. Mm -hmm. And so it's, it's uh, you know, I've always looked up to you. I've always respected um, your passion that's like never wavered. I mean, to this day, you're still just like, you know, you're making new progress, you're doing rehousing projects now. And so I just have to give a big shout out and thank you to you. that You're still at it. And thank you for the, the impact that you had on, I mean, on my life, man. Thank you. I really appreciate it. I think uh, it's good to see that we are both moving up in some shape or form. I think when we met, you were already a very talented and multi award winning DP, but the the things have changed since then, which we will talk about uh, yeah. today. Before we do though, uh, everyone who's joined us today, uh, drop a comment where you're tuning in from. We'd love to hear from you. Uh, but let's get on with this conversation. And obviously, not everyone knows you as well as I do. Uh, so for those of our viewers who are not familiar with you, talk about your journey and you know, how you got to the point where you are now. Literally. So I guess where I am now, I'm a freelance DP. Um, I really have an emphasis on um, LED volume, like XR stage cinematography, uh, virtual production, and uh, food and beverage tabletop, as well as I, I do quite a bit of uh, sports and documentary as well, just commercial cinematography overall. But uh, where I came from, I came from news, um, you know, and that sometimes that's not a glamorous place to come from necessarily but uh there are guys in the asc who also like you know cut their teeth in news and documentaries and uh it was a great way um to get started and to just basically shoot like mini documentaries every day i got to work at some pretty good tv stations that had a focus on storytelling and actually gave you time to make uh, quality content that just wasn't turn and burn so yeah after i graduated college in uh, 2006 i got a part-time job at a tv station like basically just tried to outwork everybody there, moved up very quickly. And uh, in under two years, I was the chief photographer at a media market TV station in Illinois. And then I got recruited to uh, News Channel 5 WTVF in Nashville, Tennessee. And that brought me to a little bit bigger city. And uh, Nashville, Tennessee is an entertainment city. So there's a lot going on here. There's a lot of commercials, music videos, uh, indie films, um, documentaries, TV series and an increasing number of feature films. And so Nashville as a home base, it's also centrally located in the country. Um, it's been an incredibly good uh, place for me to grow, for me to build a company. Now for me to build a family, I just became a dad. So that's like a whole new layer to things. And um, yeah, that's, I, 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 so I was in news and then I left, started a production company. And then uh, honestly, vintage lenses, you know, Put me into the rental house world. That's like, that's what started it all for me, really. Yeah, yeah. We'll talk about that for sure. Um, we've got a comment from Corey Allen on Facebook. Says Nathan, <laughs> uh, Corey, uh, we can't see your name or picture here because you need to allow Streamyard to see them. Uh, if you are watching on Facebook, you will see uh, the link in the description, and then when you comment, we can see your face and uh, and your name. There's just a bit of housekeeping there. Uh, but so Nathan, Corey, uh, you know Corey. I know Corey well. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah, yeah. He, he's also a lens nerd, so we're, we're, si we're in good company. <laughs> Here we go. Exciting. Thanks, Corey, for joining. So the next one then is an obvious one. How did you get into vintage lenses and why? So I, I, uh, the first cinema camera I ever bought, you know, this was... This was kind of in the this was in the DSLR days when the DSLR revolution was happening. So I bought a Canon T3i, you know, which was amazing. It was a super 35 sensor. You could use um, 
stills lenses that had a fast aperture and get a shallow depth of field. So that was like a new thing at the time. And then Sony came out with a cinema camera called the Sony F5. And this would have been in like 2013, 2014, I think. Um, I bought that pretty early on and it had a super 16 sensor mode. Um, and so that's when I started, uh, I discovered the Canon eight to 64 millimeter T 2.4, which is, uh, on the internet known as the hurt locker lens. And I think that was the first vintage cinema lens that I bought. I'm trying to think, Alan, did you do an overview video on that way back? There might have day? been, there might have been a post on VinceSensorVideo.com yeah. about it. Uh, I know about that lens. I don't have it. Um, it is a cool lens. What, was yeah. it actually your first vintage lens? You just went in and just went cinema straight away? I had a Sony F5, so it was PL mount. I think that was the, that was my absolute first. Yeah, because, uh, you know, when you're shooting Super 16, the range is crazy. You can get super wide and super tight, and the lens is still small, and that lens flared like crazy um, in a good way in a good way. I mean, you know, it still had crunchy colors, like good contrast, uh, but it flared unlike any lens. I It had style, man. Like it had style. I was like, oh, you know, I like vintage lenses because when you shoot something, you're like, yeah, that's that's the look I want. It's a look. It's it's different. You know, it's a it's like a little trademark to what you're trying to do. And um, so, yeah, I kind of I went in pretty early. I mean, of course, the Helios 44, two. You know, I mean, that's I feel like everyone has an experience with that. It's so affordable and it's so it's so beautiful and special. Um, so I probably bought that early on. And then I actually really early on, I think right after the Canon 8 to 64, I bought the Cook 20 to 100, which is a massive beast. Um, it's huge. Yes. But I started shooting on it a lot. I think I bought that before I bought any Cook Speed Pancros. And, and I bought into cook speed pancros after using that zoom because you know on the sony f5 the dynamic range was like good for the day but it's not good compared to what we have now and i remember shooting a scene where you know we're in tennessee so there's a lot of rural areas and barns and fields and horses and stuff like that so i was filming someone uh outside of a barn and i remember with the cook 20 to 100 looking at the image and thinking I can see into the shadows and they're in bright sunlight. And I was like, this lens is doing something I've never seen before. It was affecting the contrast of the image and it was actually allowing me, first of all, it was just more beautiful and flattering on the subject, but it was bringing out uh, more dynamic range from the camera. And I, yeah. I was just like, okay, <laughs> what's going on here? Yeah. Well, would you say that's what makes uh, vintage lens special to you or is there something else beyond that so the coolest thing about vintage lenses is that you know you and i worked together in london in 2015 you know we got to to film together and i've been learning from you since that long ago the cool thing to me is that we're still here talking about vintage lenses like i feel like i i still learn something new every day there's still a new look like they just keep on giving, like there's, there's no <laughs> end to it. And that's, that's dangerous, you know, and, uh, it's dangerous when it comes to buying things. It's very, <laughs> yes. it's very dangerous. But, uh, my favorite thing is that there's, there's no end to the, to the rabbit hole and the education. And then, um, that ends up building community because a lot of different people get interested in it. So. Indeed. Well, it's, it is very dangerous and it can get very expensive, but you found a way to offset the cost in a way, we could say that. Though I'm sure you are still buying and buying and buying, <laughs> maybe yeah. more than you need. But yeah, tell Probably. me how your whole vintage lens journey is related to you starting your rental company, and just how how did you go into starting Contrastini? Yeah, I mean it's like day by day, step by step, lens set by lens set um it definitely started because we had unique things that other people didn't have so that's been the foundation of everything and i still try to make that the foundation today is i'd like to own things that other people don't own you know i'm just less interested in lenses like 
just demand by itself isn't as interesting to me. It's more about, uh, is it special? You know, does it bring something unique and not just unique because of the name? Is it actually unique when you use it? When you see it, you're like, that's special. And that can be applied to this particular project for this particular reason. It's not just, oh, this is a fancy name or this is expensive, so I'm cool. It's like, what does it actually bring? Um, so, so you know, I, I started to handpick Cookspeed Pancros off eBay and I built a set of those. Still our Cookspeed Pancros set to this day. They're not consistent. The 75 yellows over the years. So it's, you know, PS Technic, like, uh, de-yellowed it, which basically meant it's almost uncoated. So don't shoot an interview with that thing against a window or you're done with, you know. Um, but it, it went like cook speed pancros. And then I found a set of Hawk C series, <laughs> Lomo, Lomo round front anamorphic. Yeah. Yeah. Um, that were rehoused somewhere, maybe in India or something like that. Possibly. And, um, those lenses really connected with a couple DPs, DP named John Matashek, who's blown up now. He he really started using those and the Cookspeed Pancros a lot. So I just got on the radi- the radar of a couple uh, like influential people, like really amazing DPs, and then started leveling my game up. So you know, moving more into the anamorphic world, um, and then having, but then from there though, you know, like you said, it's expensive. So first of all, I'm very aggressive. I, I mean, I worked myself to the bone for years and years, like three hours of sleep consistently night after night. Um, I was always cutting finances too close. It was reckless. Uh, I couldn't recommend it. (laughs) I don't think many people would have the stomach for that, but I'm, I didn't start out with money and I still, every dollar that I make, I just put back into the company, back into the company, back into the company. Um, so I just got very, very creative with financing, finding money, and uh, mm-hmm. still am. <laughs> well done, because <laughs> Contrast Cine and also uh, another project, your production company, Contrast Visual and the Backlot, you know, it just keeps it just keeps growing and growing. There, you know, new additions and new additions to your brand. Um, it seems quite huge right now you know looking from the side and you're just one guy you know that sort of started it all um you know when you mentioned you know lack of sleep and and you know grinding like no one else maybe you can expand a little bit on it's not about vintage lenses this thing but i just find it fascinating you know when you see someone successful like that uh you know what does it take to to get and you know how long did it take from you starting contrast scene to where you are now with the contrast visuals and backlog back backlot and you know the huge lineup of both lenses and cameras and other equipment that you guys offer yeah you know like our, our tagline is everything cinematography so really i think what makes the business work is that we're not just lenses now it started that that's where my passion is that's where my heart's at but um it 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 actually um you know, we have grip trucks. Like it, it's all about being able to provide the whole package in, in my opinion. Um, but you know, it took me, I'm not, you know, I feel like you're never done. And honestly, it never feels like it gets easier. Um, it's, it's always been a struggle. I was reckless that affected, you know, relationships. Um, and now I'm a dad, so I really have a new focus and, uh, I'm trying to simplify my life, honestly. Like I'm, I'm in the process of, of actually like moving away from the studio a little bit. I, I don't run contrast visuals anymore. It's, it's, uh, I don't, it's not, I don't run a production company anymore. So that's sort of, sort of dormant and there. I, I just freelance DP. So sort of like after COVID, I pretty much retired contrast visuals because it was just too much. Like post production is just such a grind. Um, I appreciate the experience that I had with it. But um, so, so the answer is, heavily overextend myself. Um, I'm also the president of the Nashville Filmmakers Guild, uh, which is a, a nonprofit foundation, community foundation that that does education and workshops in town. And uh, yeah, I just, I 
had too much on my plate. So especially now that I'm a dad, you know, I'm in the process of focusing on just EPing, uh, just running contrast with my amazing staff. I mean, it, it's my staff that allows me to continue on. Um, I have an amazing staff that really cares and they're very detail oriented and they're the only reason contrast Cine has grown and sustained as a company. Um, I kind of help steer the ship, but like, I'm just oversight. Like they are the heart of what's going on. Um, so, and I, and I did that very early on, you know, back in, uh, back in, 2014, 2015, I started staffing up and I realized like, I can't do everything and I need help. And it's more fun when you're not doing it on your own. And, you know, when, uh, cause the, the company is the result of so many different people's strengths coming to the table and offering solutions that I never would have come up in my wildest dreams. There's DP out there named Nick Allen who came up at contrast, um, Cameron Kennedy, Athena Kolb, Chase Lockemeyer is a first AC. There's so many people, Kit Fressa, who's a, a key grip and gas. There's so many people that that came through the company. Jiao Chen runs the company right now. Like I should name drop everyone uh, at Contrast, Casey, you know, because they're the special sauce that like makes the company sustain and grow for sure. So. Mm. So it's it's not just you. It's it's the team. It's the no. people. It's the right people that that make Absolutely. it good. Absolutely, yes. Right. And right. I've been really fortunate that you know, because a lot of people that work at a rental house, their ultimate goal is to be on set, right? And so I've been really fortunate that a lot of folks who have who have come through our staff and offered an incredible amount of value, like go off and do bigger things. And we still have a, a healthy friendship and a healthy relationship, and um, that just kind of helps things continue on. So, Brilliant. Yeah, I'm really lucky. Yeah. Brilliant. <laughs> yeah. So back to the lens nerdery. Yeah. <laughs> if there's a word like that. Um, <laughs> of course. <laughs> how many vintage lenses did you have when you first started Contrast Cine? And how many lenses do you guys have now? Well, it's, it's funny. It's, it's funny to say like when you started Contrast Cine because uh, you know, for a while I was in denial, like, is this a rental house? Because there's other great rental houses in town, one in particular that was already really established. So I was like, do I do I really want to be a rental house? You know, um, and staffing up is really like what made that flip. Um, but yeah, I don't know. When we started, we had uh, like Cook Speed Pancros. Yeah, like I said, the, the Cook Zooms. What else was early on? Um, Probably Canon FDs were, were pretty early getting those rehoused. Um, kind of got those. Yeah, I should like look through our inventory, but uh, we didn't have a whole lot. Uh, you know, we had Fujinon Cabrios, I think, pretty early, which are not vintage. So I've always tried to have at least some balance between modern and vintage. Um, and then right now we have we have a yeah, we have a lot. I don't know if I have a number for you, um, but just go on our website, contrastcine.com, and you can kind of peruse the list um we're always scheming on like what we can add you know we recently got um uh mamiya secor c's um rehoused by tls with the speed booster which was super exciting those are definitely some of my favorite lenses and then uh clint over at ancient optics is just a terrible influence <laughs> because he has so many interesting projects going on and we've i think we're his maybe number two customer in the world We've been very loyal uh, because he's doing special things, um, you know, and he's he's really like affiliated with Old Fast Glass, and uh, I really respect everything Mark's doing over there at Old Fast Glass. We kind of we kind of consider ourselves the Old Fast Glass of the South. Yes, um, for and, sure. Uh, you and Old Fast Glass are my my two favorite rentals to look at in the United States. You know, just oh, as thanks, new stuff that's coming in. Yeah. You know the things that you do. It's just get yeah, my two favorite places for sure. Thanks, man. It's. Yeah, we, we definitely can't keep up with old fast. You know, it's a different market. It's a different market, but um, I'm happy where we're at. And uh, yeah, Ancient Optics has been has been an awesome influence. Like for for uh, large format vintage zooms, um, like the Voigtlander uh, Zoomar is so cool. You know, to be able to use like 
it, it's actually quite sharp. Like I'm, I'm using it next week on a fairly corporate commercial on an LED volume. And the director, we were going to use um, the new Optimo Compact Zoom, which is uh, Ingenue's newer series of large format zooms. And the director was like, no, I like what lens flares. I was like, all right, here we go. Nice. <laughs> nice. Here we go. So you say you don't know how many lenses you have, but then uh, Coral says, can you really even own too many, <laughs> though? <Yeah. laughs> Absolutely you can, correct. man. Like, I, I don't want to. I don't want to put out there like, hey, my company's huge. Hey, we're successful. Like, hey, you know, we own everything or we will. It's like, no, it's like I'm actually slimming some things down. Like this year has been tough. You know, there's been the strikes in L.A. That's been hard on a lot of people. If you talk to Nashville crew this year, like this was my worst year ever as a DP. It was incredibly slow. Like April, like March and April, I didn't work. You know, I always find something to do, but I didn't I didn't work, you know, and that was consistent for a lot of people throughout the year. And a lot of people had a lot of challenges. So, like, I'm not out here saying, like, we're killing the game and, and don't have struggles, you know, like this year has been tough. And I sold a lot of stuff this year, you know, um, like we, we sold our Fujinon Promistas. I love those lenses, but they're huge. And Nashville tends to like uh more compact like run and gun stuff with flavor and those hit a sweet spot um in terms of like modern high end but like those even flared like they actually had more character than you would expect but it's like they're sitting on the shelf man like i gotta i gotta be realistic so it was this year was a really good exercise in like now nah, you can't just buy you got to get really good at selling too you got to you got to be, you know, as much as my heart wants to buy a set of lenses, I, I ultimately have to be like, is this going to work? If it's not going to work, it's probably got to go, Yeah. you know, or, yeah. or how can I, you know, use marketing to uh, inform more people and just like grow the knowledge about what it's capable of. So maybe it will work more, but you know, it's all about being smart. So yeah, you can't own too many lenses. Um, and you've got to be selective and you got to be smart, you know, like, and my, this is a really good balance that my staff offers. They're like, Hey man, like we need something clean. So, um, they're like, Hey, let's get cook S fours. You know, we didn't even have cook S fours. We have all this weird vintage stuff <laughs> and we didn't have like cook S fours. And so mm, we got mm. them and now, yeah, you know, the they're house. one of the most popular. Yeah. They're probably the, the most popular, Prime set that we have. Mm. Workhorse. Uh, yeah. 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 They're beautiful, right? Yeah, absolutely. So beyond of the obvious, when choosing your lenses to rent, you know, for your inventory, um, obvious is what's going to rent, what's going to make money. Is there any other way that you choose lenses? you know, how you try to fit in, you know, the certain gaps and things like that. Yeah, totally. I mean, it's about the balance. Like we need to have safe stuff, safe, modern, commercial, right? Um, also, Nashville has some, you know, live multicam stuff. So sometimes you just need, you know, four cameras with really affordable zooms. So I'm always trying to hit every price point and then have the fun stuff but also have the safe stuff. Um, so like really, ho hopefully next year we'll get signature primes kind of in that, in that vein, you know? And the cool thing, the, the reason I really want to get the signature primes is because with the rear uh, diopters, you can mess with the image too. So if you want perfect optics, you have them, but if you want to get a little weird, you can add like the plus and minus magnetic diopters to the back. Um, which I think is, uh, you know, a really welcome innovation. Um, and definitely I used to get more weird stuff. Like I'll never buy a set of unrehoused anamorphics that have a spinning front telescoping front element. Like I'll never do it. Like it just pisses off first. They seize too much, you know, like, so if, if I were to get a set of weird vintage anamorphics, I'd be like, 
you know, either use the orbital system, but honestly, no, probably just be like, do a rehouse first. Mm -hmm. And, um, and like, you know, GL optics has been doing, um, a lot of really creative projects. Um, and so it's cool that there are companies out there that for a price would take like one bespoke set of lenses and like design a rehouse just for that, you know? Mm -hmm. So it's, it's crazy that the, the services are out there if you can, if you can afford it. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So, so the, it sounds like a rehousing is a must have nowadays for contrast cine. Like if a, if a set wants to be in the lineup, it needs to be rehoused, you know, no, no more original bodies and stuff like that. You know what the dream lens, yeah. you know, have you rehoused that? Cause I know mm -hmm. you have a dream lens from the way back. Yeah. So zero optic rehoused our set of uh, Canon range finders. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yep. Yeah. So, so those are like an M mount right now. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. But rehoused. No they more original yep. bodies, original mechanics and stuff the, like that. The only set of lenses that we don't have rehoused that still kind of works is uh, one set, a very special set of Canon FDs um, that Simod uh, did a, a city mod on. And I only did that because it seemed like, well, it was a slow year. So I'm just kind of like being patient. And then it seemed like most of the rehouse companies are like, like zero optic is like four years out or something like that. So I'm like, all right, like it's a, it's an insane set of FDs. There's two of the like unicorn 24 millimeter SSC sphericals so that one can be made into an 18, um, you know, with a wide angle adapter, mm -hmm. um, which is, which is cool because when you go wider, you don't lose light. I don't know if you gain light, but you don't lose light. Uh, it's when you go tighter with uh, adapters that you lose a little bit of light. Mm -hmm. So to take the 24 to an 18, it's still a super speed. Um, so that that set, I think, would go from like a 10 or a 12 to like a 200. And they're all SSCs. They have I have all mint condition sphericals for the 24, 55, and 85. And then I think that 135 is the only one that's not an SSC because the they L one. Yeah. Well, they might have, but the L version is like a F2. It's just like so much faster. I was like, that's worth it to just yeah, have that yeah. e extra extra speed. Yeah, but, yeah. They, so, they, they didn't make uh, the, the SSC one. Well, not they all have the C coatings, but back in the day, they didn't make the fast one that you okay, want. Right. Yeah. 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 So I imagine that's going to become a house set at some point. Yes. And that will be one of our best sets. I think it'll be the biggest set probably that we have. Um, and it'll be one of the most beautiful, I think. So do you then have a personal vintage lens collection, maybe Henry house or something like that outside of contrast Cine? Um, Not much. There are, there are definitely some like, lenses I've bought that I'm just projecting to figure out it, you know, like lenses where no rehousing exists. Um, and I'm figuring out, you know, can I get a, a design for them? So yeah, there, there's a couple out there. I'm not gonna, I'm not gonna leak what I'm working on right now. But, mm, mm. Um, well, let yeah. me know if you need help. <laughs> Some medium format stuff, you know, oh, just nice. kind of similar, um, similar to the Mimia kind of thing. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Um, but other people, I'm sure other people just beat me to the punch because I got too much. I got too much going on. Well, there are loads of interesting lenses to your house still. Um, yeah, I'm always looking at oh, yeah. at you know what's what's out there that that might be interesting to people. You know, in my work with yeah. iron glass, sort of looking at you know what what could we uh, as a project make that you know right. hasn't been done well we or the in Genes, the right yeah 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 we just did the jenna's which is super cool yeah um, they have been done to be fair but uh okay we feel like we can give them well a bigger set first of all a uh, okay. more bigger lineup but also okay. just maybe a little bit more affordable maybe we even are pushing the quality 
higher for that price and you know just trying to continue the idea of sort of rehousing for all which which i know is not yeah. the best for the rental market maybe because you almost want to pay more so you can rent <laughs> rent at a higher rate um nah man it's a it's a free world you know like the more people can have access to stuff that helps them get the look that they want and helps them get jobs it's a free world man you know nobody ever discouraged me from from buying things like you know people should I, I think it's awesome that you're offering more affordable options that still have like an amazing look uh i'm excited to see that you know especially that helps that helps younger people get involved and maybe find that like special you know a special sauce mm -hmm. earlier on and that can help their careers so well the great thing about vintage lenses is that you can start with a five dollar lens you know yeah. like you can start with the cheapest lens and sort of discover some of the characteristics you know just pick something yeah. on ebay and then you can go up to 100 and you can then uh, go to see mod lens and modify it and make it much more usable and then you have at some point you want to invest in rehousing for whatever reason you can so there's like it's very open to everyone no one is yeah. isolated from from experiencing this thing right. that's what i love about it. that's how i got into it totally totally and, and that's actually, why i we... wanted to promote it because i was like this yeah. this is this is amazing more people should know about it <laughs> yeah and price isn't equivalent to to necessarily quality or um character like to this day we actually do have one really poorly cinemodded set of like soviet lenses you know like we have the really nice mark ii set from iron glass thank you <laughs> um and thank you to iron glass uh we just got the new mark mark ii um but we do still have like an ef mount cine modded set for for dps who come in and are like my budget's low but i want to get like kind of weird it's mm -hmm. like well mm -hmm. well perfect you know use mm -hmm. the use the mirror one b you know yes. Yes. like like you use the mirror lenses and the helios lenses and honestly like you're not going to get more of a look from more expensive lenses like those are some of the most distinct stunning beautiful lenses and that's why those you know those lenses were used on batman like that's why huge dps are using those lenses on feature films because they're special yes i agree i always call them cheap. yeah and they're cheap and they are maximum maximum character lenses that you might want to dial yeah. down but if you want to go to the extreme you go there yeah and then you see if you want to roll it back a bit and you know go for like r or or whatever else yeah. canon fd and and the like that that have a bit more control you know more speed and and stuff like that but yeah definitely a great way to get into vintage lenses but yeah. at some point before you started uh contrast scene all your lenses were basically your own, you know, just your personal lenses, vintage lenses, mm -hmm. somewhat rare, you know, and precious. Was there that barrier of, uh, you know, this is this is vintage lens, you know, what if this guy scratches it and mm -hmm. how I'm going to replace the sediment and stuff like that? Because that's what prevented me from uh, ever renting my lenses, because I was like, no, okay. this is my, these are my babies. <laughs> Man, we've been pretty lucky you know i have a i have a really good service manager um casey mcdonald who you know checks every single lens after it comes back we've been pretty lucky so far i'm, I'm knocking on wood here um so it, it hasn't it hasn't held me back like ultimately you know it's stuff you know um to me it's a creative tool it's it's a way to grow a business it's a way to to make you know a commercial or music video look awesome but like ultimately it's stuff so when things get broken my my heart doesn't really sink like like usually when things get broken i'm more concerned about how the person feels who broke it because i know that they didn't mean to it was probably an accident so i usually try to like reduce the pressure on people and just let them know like hey it's it's an accident it's a lens it's probably replaceable if not 
that's rough. <laughs> I don't have a lot of confidence in insurance because we had some gear, we had some gear stolen this year, and uh, insurance was did not have our back. So that's a little scary. You know, it's a risky business, um, and yeah, we've kind of, it's been a rough, <laughs> a rough year. We had, you know, business was slower. We got robbed a couple times, but all that stuff like just makes you better. You know, what doesn't kill you makes you stronger. And so we're just getting better and better and more careful and a little more restrictive. But no, if 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 we've got it, people can use it, you know, and I hope they take good care of it. Brilliant. So let's get into the personal favorites. What's your fa favorite focal length? Doesn't matter Oof. the lens, just the focal length. And we explain why. Uh, my favorite focal length is the 32 millimeter on a super 35 sensor. Um, I love how that feels, especially in a narrative setting when you get the camera close to a subject and it's medium wide, you know, uh, you still see the world around them. You see what's going on. Um, but, and, and I would have to attach that to the cook speed pancro, the 32 millimeter cook speed pancro, uh, the love for that focal length is attached to that prime, how it makes people look, the edge softness, um, you know, the, the shape for the bokeh, it's got kind of a little swirl because the pancros uh, have those, those swirly um, aperture elements that at least accents the bokeh, which I kind of don't like when the rehouse companies always replace the apertures. At least in the Pancros, uh, like PS Technic, our, our PS Technic Pancros have the original iris. And I'm glad because it affects the image, you know? Um, mm. So, but yeah, 32 okay. millimeter, maybe. Okay. So what's what's then the favorite characteristic of, of the vintage lens to you? You mentioned a <laughs> little bit just there. Yeah, I would say... I would say the color rendition probably like the and this applies to like the cooks and uh the mamias um there's just sort of like they bring out pastel colors a little bit lower contrast so they're like very forgiving and and more like a a painting you know when i think of vintage lenses i kind of think of them on a spectrum of like um real life to like the fake or otherworldly, you know, like Elite Series 7, like those anamorphics take you to a completely different world. Like they look nothing like reality. Uh, it's very like imp impressionistic and it's like a completely new perspective and take on reality. Um, but the Mamiya's like I shoot some of the like most safe commercials I've ever shot run the Mamiya's, you know, they're still sharp. Uh, you can add all kinds of filtration for them and still be fine. Um, so, yeah, that's it's it's kind of all about that spectrum and, and having the options and like you know being able to choose. Mm. And of course, of course, flares, man. I mean, like the flares are are endlessly interesting. You know, like I, I think the lens that first, well, okay, like I said, the Canon eight to sixty four has like that multi-element flare that a zoom can give you because there's so many optics and just so much going on in there. Kind of like the earlier series of the Ingenue 25 to 250s. And actually, I think Corey has uh, a lens I don't have. It's the Ingenue... I don't know. Corey, can you add it in the, the thread? But I saw somebody recently rented it from him and the flare was like cooler than any other Ingenue zoom lens I've seen. Something to the 120, I think. Um, uh, so maybe I'll get that one someday, Corey, <laughs> or just <laughs> sub yours. Um, but uh, there was there's a a Pentax Takamar 24 millimeter. I'm pretty sure I saw on your website. I bet. Do you do you know that lens? Okay, uh, 17 to 102. I, the yes. flare on that thing is insane. Wow, 17 to 102. It's insane. Interesting. I bet, that, 
is that a big lens? I think that lens is like kind of big, but, um, hmm. but yeah, the flare on the Pentax Tacomar 24 millimeter is like wide that, that lens has like very few, um, aperture blades, like maybe like five or something. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So it, and there's all sorts of internal reflections in the lens mm -hmm. and it's like golden. It's like, it's probably on your website. Which one is it again? The 24, Pentax, did you say? Pentax Tacomar 24 millimeter. Pretty sure. I don't think I've ever tried that lens, but mm -hmm. I should now. I think we, we have some uh, like interesting information to look up afterwards. Yeah, I don't know if I still have it. I I mean, those lenses are, are pretty awesome. They're like crunchy. I'm pretty sure I learned about them from you. Maybe not that particular one, but. Well, I, I try to share other people's information as well. Okay. So it's not, it's not just me. So yeah, who yeah. knows? Might've yeah, been. might've been, but yeah, that lens, it, it gives you like the, the lines, you know, where it like breaks the light up into to sort of streaky lines, probably, especially when it hits like the side. And then, uh, it just gives you like harsh golden circles, which is similar to like what's going on with the range finders and things like that. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, at least mine did. Who knows? Maybe that's not. Like, that's the thing. But, that's yeah. the thing about vintage lenses. Yeah. There, there's no none two that are exactly the same. Al right. Almost, you know, the the yeah. condition of the lens, the life they had, it can all affect things. And you might be like, oh, I love this slow contrast mm -hmm. that this particular lens produces, and then turns out it has a lot of haze, and that's why. And yeah. then another one is nice and you know punchy. So you yeah. just you just never know. You have to be quite subjective in your both recommendations and your choices you know totally but it's also kind of a cool thing about inch lenses you know you just kind yeah. of discover gems that you right. didn't expect maybe yeah yeah like our, our cook speed pancro definitely uh the 32 millimeter definitely looks like it has a built-in hollywood black magic filter to it you know it's doesn't match the others <laughs> like if you want like a dreamy sort of like hazed out look like somebody just recently did a, a one take commercial on it on Steadicam and it's like, that's the look they wanted and it was perfect for it. So. Exactly. So what's then the favorite vintage lens set? It can be both from Cine world and based on photography optics it can be both or one. A set, that not, is. not one lens. What okay. set do you like? Damn, that is that is a very hard question. Overall, I'd probably have to say the Canon rangefinders. Yeah, because like you can, yeah, n nothing looks like them. Like cool the flares, the flares are more interesting than K thirty five flares. The bokeh is more distinct. You can get absolutely crazy the and our our 85 millimeter is quite sharp and fast and they're full frame like that 85 is insane and obviously the dream lens the 50 nothing looks like the 50 millimeter dream lens you know so what's what's your range finder lineup what do you have in your set so it's it's zero optic and we still have to add more primes to it i've also been lazy there uh, because zero optic is just booked out so much. Alex, if you're watching, look a brother up. <laughs> um, so our, cause our set's kind of limited. It's four primes. It's the, uh, it's the 28, 35, 50, 85. Mm -hmm. And then I think we've got a 19, 25 and 100 on the way. Mm -hmm. And the 19 is like this big. Mm-hmm. It's yeah, like tiny. So, yes. so th yes. that set definitely needs to be built out. But uh, so it's limited on the the wide side. So we'll usually just if someone really needs wide lenses, then we'll supplement from the FD set. Mm -hmm. And mm -hmm. yet, it's your favorite set. So does it say that you don't necessarily need so many focal length oh, to shoot yeah. stuff? How many do you generally use? You know, you have a set of five, six, maybe eight, and you want to shoot. In a general shot, how many do you end up actually using? As few as possible <laughs> sometimes, man. Uh, it really depends on the location to me. Like, um, 
yeah it like Next week, I have a shoot um, at View Studio in Nashville, which is a XR stage. And we're going to live on the uh, Voigtlander Zoomar, which is a 36 to 82 or something like that. It's a very mid-range zoom, but we're on a techno crane. So we can like, uh, it's a large wall, but you're still limited because it is a wall and you don't want to see the seams. So we don't need to get that wide. Our widest on the Venice 2, since it's large format, will probably just be 50 and we'll just back the camera off. I like to zoom zoom with my feet. I like to get close. I like to get intimate. Um, I do shoot on zooms a lot because, you know, I find if you pick the right zoom, you're really not compromising. Um, you know, that does come from my ENG days a little bit, man. I, I like move around. I was fast. Um, it's more about like, you know, throwing the camera on the ground, you know, like getting on top of the news van, you know, it's more about like being creative and, thinking about how you can get a perspective that's unusual. Um, and, uh, you know, a zoom lens, it's like it, you have all the options right there. So, uh, which is why like um, having large format vintage zooms is cool because you're not compromising on quality. You're not compromising on character and you can just run around. Like <laughs> we have the Canon FD 50 to 300. And I uh, recently, did a commercial where I handheld that. Um, awesome. And it's it's massive, but like, like what more do you need? <laughs> like, mm. so we, we got really tight. You know, I mean, limited on close focus a little bit, but um, that was pretty fun. It was a good workout. I love that. Uh, me and one of my lens nerd friends uh, called Daniel Fox often discuss, you know, various underrated lenses and, and zoom lenses and primes and this and that. And he will sometimes send me a screenshot, something he shot with some humble zoom that yeah. people would usually shit on, you know, mm -hmm. if he said so, but, mm -hmm. you know, we fully agree that it's whatever works for the project, you know, it's totally. people get so obsessed with some particular way. You know, it has to be a prime or it has to be that brand mm -hmm. and, you know, stuff like that. So I'm, I'm, I'm loving that you actually using zooms a lot because oh, yeah. we, we see so much of prime use and, mm -hmm. and I've been guilty of sort of going that way when, when I can, you know, it's kind of fun to swap primes and sort of limit yourself yep. into a focal length. But I also remember my days of doing live events and stuff like that. And I'll just be on those zooms. And yeah. I'd and I'd be on the most convenient stuff, and I would compromise maybe on uh, going too fast, you know. Maybe I, you know, I'm on a slower lens because I want a longer range. But at the end of the day, that meant that I I got what I wanted, exactly. And you know, instead of maybe not not being close enough or maybe not being wide enough, but one stop faster, you know, it's right. not, not always right. the most important thing. No, and especially on like large format sensors, like. I, you don't really usually you don't need to go that much faster than a two eight. Like your depth of field is pretty shallow unless you want to get crazy, you know, like so these days I, I try to like sort of like relax on the shallow depth of field stuff. If I'm shooting large format, shoot it like a four or even a five, six sometimes, you know, like to see the background a little bit. And 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 I shoot a lot of product stuff. So a lot of times I have to think about my first AC. And I want to set them up for success. So it's like, we're doing a dolly move into a, you know, a, a whiskey bottle or something like that. Like, I don't want him, him or her. I don't want my first AC, like always fighting focus. I want them feeling confident and it's a team effort. Um, and also like with directors, like using a zoom, that's a director up for success because I'm more efficient and they're mm -hmm. not waiting on me and we're not cutting it's it's better for talent too, you know. Like mm -hmm. we're not cutting for a lens change. We're just like rolling, you know. We're moving, and and also if the camera is on, you know, the camera's on like a dolly or in an interesting position or on a crane or something like that. Like it's more of a hassle to change lenses too. So it's like nah, just put a zoom on it. We'll get everything we need from that one lens. But but all that means is like you have to be that much more selective about what zoom you choose. Mm -hmm. So that's what's great to have the options, you know? 
Mm. What's your favorite? What's your favorite set of vintage lenses? Oh man, you put me under pressure here. Come on, no, man. I have to answer I, I questions. Gotta I gotta know. Have you uh, answered that on on camera? Documented? No, no, no. You put me bro. under pressure now. Oh my god. Dude, I want to know. I want. I don't want to be biased. I don't want to be like biased because you're like the vintage lens king. No, 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 no. I'm yeah. just one of the guys, but I appreciate no, that anyway. No, 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 no. You're, so, you're like you're like up there with like Jay. Jay, Jay <laughs> no, and Chris. I could never reach Jay's Dude, <laughs> level. Dude, you've influenced so many people. You have no mm. idea. You're the king. And I and if I'm, I helped, if I don't want to influence anyone, but if I helped anyone, I'm very you're happy. Help. You're helping people, dude. You helped Brilliant. me. Okay, so uh, really feel on the pressure here um you know why this thing with iron glass happened in the first place was be because I, I always loved my soviet set always loved my soviet lenses i was never using them for anything i was always recommending them i, I must have told you get the helios i must tell everyone <laughs> it's an it's amazing get it you know oh mirror 20 is it's brilliant 20 you know it has so much character and yet I was never using them. I felt almost like a like a fraud in a way, you know, because mm -hmm. I was I was just using Canon FD 50 millimeter 1.4 instead a lot of times instead of using my Helios. Um, and I had a lot of instances like that where I would use something that was more convenient to use, mm -hmm. because because the original bodies on those Soviet lenses they just they're a nightmare. There's mm -hmm. there's so many wobbles and. Yeah. you know mount play and image yeah. can start jumping and before you know it you don't actually want to use it for anything serious so yeah. so i connected with iron glass to modify my set and they modified it and it was great addition of focus gears and pl mount and this and that but certain things remained certain yeah. things certain wobbles in the body you know they remained there was no way to take it out and i said to them yeah. i said you know i love it thank you but there are some things that you just will not be able to fix. And, you know, I have to be honest, you know, in my opinion that, you know, that, that's what it is. So if you want to take care of those particular things, you should try to rehouse those lenses. Yeah. And they were like, let's, let's rehouse it together. You know, you got all this, you know, like knowledge. And I thought I had knowledge, which now <laughs> I understand I had zero knowledge about rehousing. And thankfully, you know, a bit like more now. I know this is an interview about me, but I'm like honestly curious, like how much of a role did you play in like the design and like figuring all that out? Well, uh, basically I had this, uh, the most fun position where I was just throwing uh, ideas of things I want to see in those lenses okay. and they would just try to implement them, you yeah. know, yeah. with, with the first, with the first version. Uh, one of the reasons why it was so simple and inexpensive is because I wanted it, but I didn't know if anyone else would want this. Like it could have been a massive fail, you know, because mm -hmm. people were still laughing in the comments when I announced the first lens. They're like, oh. this $50 lens for $1,000. Oh, right. You know, are you right. having, you know, sort of, you know, trying to fraud literally like <laughs> people like, you know, some people that don't understand what rehousing is. So even even right. that, even at one thousand, to some people it felt like a crazy idea. Right. So it had to be a very simple thing, and there I I didn't have as much input into what's going to be the final product because I sort of allowed the team to do what what they can at the time. With Mark II, as you might have seen yourself, we've done so much more. Like mm -hmm. we've learned, I've learned, uh, I you know understand what's needed so much more now you know cool. um so many requests so many things that actually people wanted mm -hmm. uh, you you might have had some feedback as well mm -hmm. um and you know a lot of it wasn't a positive feedback and it was great because it's just it's just a new feature list just make it better yeah uh so with the with the second version i think i pretty much ticked like 90 Five percent of my uh, wish list uh, in that in that second version, and there are a few few features that are still left that will we might see in the Zeiss Yena set. Mm -hmm. Beyond that, I think uh, it's going to be 
absolute top level rehousing. It's already Mark II is already a brilliant rehousing, but oh, absolutely, yeah. it's it's gonna be it's gonna be up there with with any with everyone else, and there will not be one thing that you could point at and say, oh, but this company has that and you don't have it. Mm -hmm. So that's amazing. So, so that's so that's uh, and it's a lot of fun as well. It's like you know, I always dreamed of doing something like that. You know, like mm -hmm. being involved in some sort of vintage lens related project. And I always thought it's gonna be, um, you know, one of those uh, earlier Chinese lenses that we would see from Mitacon and you know, okay. not 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 the not the popular ones that we see nowadays. But I thought it's gonna be one of those up and coming Chinese optics that just. I'm gonna collab with, and they're gonna do like a decoded set or something, and mm -hmm. call it Vintage Lens for Video Edition. Yeah. I thought that was the top of it, you know. Okay. That's yeah. the, all, all I can ever dream about. Yeah. And then you know this happened, and this is so much more fun because this is about real proper vintage lens. This is giving them another 50 years of life, making them more usable for video because there are so many websites and and uh, so many people that look at vintage lens video in general you know for photography enthusiasts and stuff like that yeah my, my point was always about using vintage lenses for video right, <laughs> it's right. A, it's, like, it's like a stupid name it's like the most obvious name but i thought like yeah. it says everything <laughs> <laughs> it's like it's like you could i would i should be coming up with like an interesting name but you just, i just want vintage lens for video <laughs> it's, <laughs> it's very clear also one thing i appreciate is that it's not vintage lenses for cinema like you're not like making it out to be you know it's like when people are like such and such studios yes and they yes. like work from their house you know it's like yes 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 i humble, didn't wanna it's accurate i didn't want to go into vintage lens for filmmaking because again that's that's adds more like longer words into it i thought the vintage yeah. lens for just simple sounds simple and also because it yeah. came from the most humble sort of ways of just yeah. It's it's for everyone. It's not just for filmmaking. You could use it for commercial, or no, you know, like mm -hmm. corporate or whatever. You can use it for anything. It, yeah. Though I fully agree that maybe modern lenses, not maybe, certainly modern lenses are better for certain projects. Sure. You can use vintage lenses for a lot of things, uh, mm -hmm. as you mentioned yourself. Some some place where you would expect to use modern lenses, you end up using vintage lenses still. So. That's yeah, a long, long say, answer know, to your question <laughs> about the favorite set, <laughs> which no, is that's... which is probably the Soviet set, but I feel like I'm now too biased. So I feel like I have to come up with a second option. And my second option no, was that's very fitting. That's it, it's it's fitting. And and I'm glad I'm honestly like relieved that yeah. that's your answer. Well, you see, if if that wasn't the case, I think this this collaboration between me and Iron Glass would have never happened. Yeah. It's my passion yeah. for making those lenses more usable. That's that's what that's what made it happen. Yeah. Uh, the second one would have the second one that I've spoken for a long time. I found a picture from my Instagram the other day from 2014, hmm. where I had a Zeiss Yena 20 millimeter, and you know I reposted it because it was on the Dayzak day, uh, and I was like, wow, was I into Zeiss Yena for almost 10 years now. <laughs> so I've been I've been talking yeah. about those as well for the longest time and I've made my $1,000 guide in 2017, you know, ages ago as well. And, you know, that was another one that was on my list. I was like, I really love those lenses. Yeah. You know, let's see if I yeah. can get a rehouse. So a lot of these things that I have in Iron Glasses, it's my passion for the particular lenses. Yeah. And I would love to see them in a rehousing that I would love to use. And when you have something like that, what you love, it's so easy to promote because you you hundred percent believe oh, yeah. into it. For sure. You don't you don't feel like you are cheating anyone. You are actually just spreading love. Right. Yeah. Yeah. And that's that's why I'm you know I'm grateful for the community in Nashville because it's like, you know, it is an excuse for me to have like things that I love, you know, and then I love sharing it, and for other people to you know, to share in that love and to find the excitement for themselves and for their projects and. It's a, it's a really fortunate and rewarding place to be. Absolutely, uh, and just so that I don't sound biased, because that's those are the projects that I'm working on with Iron Glass. <laughs> my third, my third favorite, <laughs> is very simple. Uh, yeah, I, I went way over. 
that's okay. <laughs> you gave that's me okay. to. You shouldn't have asked me a question because I will just I, talk I, about I, lenses I, for two hours. <laughs> Don't ask me even one here, question. That's why we're here. Uh, the third one is uh, an easy one. It's kind of boring, but it's kind of NFD because again, it's something that I've been using for the longest time, way before. Firstly, uh, Canon NFD became popular due to rehousing and people using more mirrorless cameras. I was quite early into Sony ecosystem when people were still mostly on Canons, you know, mm -hmm. on, on some of the latest Canon DSLRs and C300s and so on. I was early into the, like, uh, into the Sony cam. I was, uh, mm. I had the little uh, NAX5N you know, little okay, compact yeah. one. I had yeah. a Sony FS100, you know, like a more of a, like a proper camera. And, you know, yeah. I had a lot of those cameras that were not quite accepted at the time from Sony. Yeah. Uh, but that gave me opportunity to try all those other vintage lenses that no one was using. Oh, yeah, yeah. No, that's why we've always been a Sony house is because, like, you know, they went E-mount early and you could adapt that to anything that you wanted. Yeah, yeah. So, so my love for Canon is not... It's not because of this latest hype that we've seen in the yeah. last few years. It's actually uh, to do with my genuine love for the image. That oh yeah, for sure. That you know, I've I've enjoyed and I recommend it to people, and I've made some prize guides back in the day. And again, they, those were sort of ignored. Well, maybe a few people, maybe like yourself, yeah. who actually appreciated it. Maybe they they, they saw it and saw uh, some sort of usefulness in that but majority yeah, we, of people kind of ignored it we had fds before like you know we knew about the aspherical's and the yeah. connection to the a35s and yeah yeah that, that all came later yeah uh yeah i learned about that from chris probst yeah. mm, mm. i can i can say for sure that majority of people kind of ignored that because i was i was raving and raving about canon fd lenses and mm -hmm. they were not they were not really shooting up and then suddenly you know yeah. we had other things that happen in the ecosystem and they, they shut up. And I was like, okay, I told you so. I was like, I told yeah. you so. In my mind anyway. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> um, so Il Ilko Reyes on Facebook, Ilko, please uh, I, please allow StreamYard to see your name uh, so we can, we can showcase your beautiful picture on here as well. But Ilko Reyes says, MK choose a great talent. Thank you, Ilko. I appreciate that. Um, here we have another question. Uh, let me try to Tim, read your name. I'm sorry. Tim in the uh, chat. What's up, Tim? Vijayami. Vijayami. I think that would be the, that would be the right uh, the right way to pronounce your name. I'm sorry if I if I butchered it. I didn't mean that. Yes, and then uh, Tim as well. Yeah, nice to have you, Tim. Thanks for joining in. Um, so, uh, talking a little bit about um, you know the hype and and stuff like that, you know, with the cannons. Do you find any lenses to be overrated at all mm. uh, at the moment? You know, like like cannons, they sort of they sort of became almost too hyped at some point. You know, do you, yeah. do you feel? that about any lenses obviously as a rental i don't expect you to say anything like that but let me think um i don't know i i need more well yeah i don't, I don't let me give it let me give you an easier <laughs> one easier one then because because i was never gonna ask this one but then we we, we started talking about the hype and stuff like that but the, the original question that I was going to ask is uh, what is the most underrated vintage lens or a set of vintage lenses, in your opinion? Okay. Well, these aren't, these aren't vintage, although they might be vintage, like, soon enough. Well, I'll say it anyway. It's fine. I don't know. Airy Ultra Primes, man. Mm. Um, For sure. Yeah. Yeah, people don't use those a lot. And that's like, can be like a really beautiful, like go to set, you know, it's kind of safe, but still has a look like some of the biggest Hollywood movies have been shot on on ultra primes. Um, and yeah, they have a look like uh, most of the set 
most in the set cover full frame. Not all of them, but I think the the Tider Primes cover full frame. So I think I definitely slept on Ultra Primes for way too long. And then we got a set and um, uh, yeah, so people have enjoyed using them. I've I've enjoyed using them. It's just kind of like a rock solid go to. Um, I mean, I'm I'm always impressed with how Zeiss Super Speeds, you know, can play on corporate safe modern commercial stuff you know you think oh these are these are older these are vintage it's like i mean those can be like um just can add that little extra luster you know to a to a commercial mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. um I'm still trying to think on that overrated uh, i don't nah, know don't like, worry I, I don't know. Black that's... wings were, were like really big here for oh. a while. And maybe, I think I'm just jealous because we don't have them. I think I'm just a hater. Yeah, just jealous. Uh, yeah, I think I'm just I think I'm just salty because we don't have them. Well, we we like to spread love mostly. So I think I think I'm gonna retire the rated question <laughs> for good because um... no, it's a good question, man. I like controversy is fun, right? Conflict. That's that's what makes movies interesting. Like I guess, I guess. But we don't want black wings to to blackmail you. Oh, okay. well, <laughs> we could talk about some lenses like no one ever used, like Cook S7s. Like those mm-hmm. things are huge, and like I don't know many rental houses that have them. It's it just seems like people just skipped over that series. Mm-hmm. Um, Interesting. Which is just yeah, even like Cook S5s, which I think are like really fast, like. It's funny how certain things just stick. Yeah, like S4s, people yeah. just like S fours, right? Yeah. Um, and then the the new S eights look really interesting, but from um, companies I've talked to, they just haven't taken off yet. I mean, I've I've never got my hands on them, but those certainly look interesting. The price tag is wild. Mm-hmm. Okay, underrated Leica M's, a uh, Leica mm-hmm. Leica M's. Yeah, people don't yeah. know about those too much. Um, mm-hmm. But now with the Hugos coming up, um, I think we we have the like M zero point eights, and every time people use those, they're like, "Whoa, you know, there's super small, there's super speeds, there's the the fifty millimeter Noctilux that's like f point nine five, that thing's mm-hmm. crazy, um, and then I think there's even like a twenty one or a twenty five in the set that's also a super speed." Um, those like bring a lot to the table, and I, I think uh, um, GL should rehouse our set probably next year, so that we'll have like a set of Hugos uh, with the Noctilux, um, without them being Hugos. But they'll, you know, mm-hmm. they'll maybe even be better than the Hugos, honestly. Um, so, but... so I don't know if you watched uh, Jay's interview last week, but he mentioned Ultras as well. And and you mentioned oh, really? ultras, and then Ilko wow. says here that you know you can buy fr- new fronts for for the ultras, have huh. them uncoated, you know, uh, it's it's a great way to have two looks, cool. and uh, and Jay also mentioned that a lot of rentals and and some companies are messing around with the ultras because they're just so great, and you can yeah. just tune them up a bit and make them a bit more interesting, but they just cool. like such a great base, and you are the yeah. second person in the row to mention ultras, which is which is quite okay. interesting. Yeah, yeah. Awesome. So, so guys, now you know. Now you know. Ultra, pri- <laughs> buy those ultras before prices jump up again. <laughs> it's like I don't know. You know, we always use the word like cinematic. Like, what does that mean? Like, it's such an overused term. Um, maybe that's an an overrated term. Cinematic. There we go. Not we don't we don't know overrated lenses, but an overrated term. Cinematic. But no, I think those lenses have a cinematic look. Like, they're forgiving to skin tones. They do enough to the background to add some separation. Like the fall off is pleasing. The color tonality is pleasing. Um, the sharpness is, is it, it doesn't have, um, what's the, it's not like overly micro contrasty, I mm-hmm, guess. Mm-hmm, it's, mm-hmm. it's yeah. So, um, and and there's one more thing about them. I believe they also built like a tank. Well, Ilko told yeah. me a few times that is, is the lens that he services the least. They just they okay. just lost. Yeah. 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 And cool. I know people are rehousing Zeiss Super Speeds now. Mm-hmm. Um, that is one set that are 
ours are not rehoused. It's the original housing. And mm-hmm. similarly, like, we probably will get them rehoused at some point, but that housing is just pretty solid. Like, mm-hmm. it's, it stands the test of time. It's great. So, what is then the most rented set of lenses or individual lenses uh, at Contrast Cine? Uh, for zooms, it would be the Ingenue Easy Zooms, I believe. Mm-hmm. Um, those are hard to keep in stock. Um, and they're they're F two, you know, T two. Um, they are, you know, they're just they're beautiful lenses. So yeah, those are really popular. And then Coke has Force, um, total go tos. Mm-hmm. Um, Ancient Optics uh, Kawa full frames have been working. Uh, we've been shipping those around the country. Um, people are loving those, especially for narrative. Um, those are wild. They're not fast, so that's interesting. You kind of gotta like. Flip a switch in your brain and be like, okay, I'm going to shoot with a lens. Maybe I think some of the lenses on the wider end are like a three, five. Yes. Like, we're, yes. no, people aren't used to that. But, mm-hmm. you know, if you're shooting on a, a Venice or, you know, even with the uh, enhanced sensitivity modes on the Alexa 35, like you can shoot with slow lenses and still make your day. Yeah. And uh, those lenses, man, they've, they've got some magic in them. Shout out, Green. Shout out, Asian Optics. All day long. Brilliant. So what is the latest addition to the lineup and why did you choose it? Um, I'm going to talk about Clint again. We don't have them yet, but we'll be, I think we should be the second company in the world after Old Fast to get their new Pets Deluxe series. And, um, you know, we were planning on having TLS rehouse our just the classic that's full lenses. Um, cause especially for, um, music videos, you know, uh, you just center frame your talent and the whole world is just blown out and swirling around them. It's an insane look. It's, it's an affordable lens. What's up, Clint? Thanks for, Probably, Clint. Thanks for everything you do, man. Um, and so the, the pets flux lenses also have a ring where you can control the amount of craziness basically you know it moves the optics and changes the amount of of distortion and probably chromatic aberration and changes the bokeh it's kind of like the airy hero lenses yeah. yes yeah. yes yeah so exactly. i think you know that's it's just like when tls uh built-in speed boosters to the mamiya 645 lenses now ancient optics is like building in this new functionality to give the operator control that they didn't have before and it's like okay maybe i only want the close-up to be crazy you know and then i need the wider shot to be a little more subtle you can just Mm -hmm. like dial it in as you go that's going to be so fun Mm -hmm. yeah what what asian optics do is absolutely incredible every project is just more exciting than the next one Uh, when i grow up i want to be asian optics (laughs) (laughs) and they find they find the stuff that just like i didn't know about you know yeah I'm like, yeah. where does this come from? You know? Yeah. Um, and, so and, it's, got... and, and the beautiful thing, thing is that a lot of the stuff is in works for years. And, mm-hmm. and just the patience that Clint has, it's out of this mm-hmm. world. I would just want to yeah. scream and, you know, sort of be excited <laughs> about it. And he's just yeah. uh, the best yeah. patience out there. So, yeah. yeah it's really terrible cool. for my pocketbook. It's yes. terrible. <laughs> Very dangerous. <laughs> Uh, okay, so so you pretty much answered this next question already with the Petsvel Axis, but is there anything else that, well, Blackwing 7 maybe you mentioned yeah. as well, anything that you're excited to, to use yourself sometime soon or maybe have in your inventory? Yeah, um, yeah, Blackwings. It's sort of like some stuff that's already in the market, but stuff that we just need to have, you know, just to be tried and true. Uh, Black Wings, uh, Signature Primes, Ingenue 24-290. Yeah, those are those are some of the, the primary things. I want to get... Uh, we already, I, I shoot with the Ingenue Optimo Compact 37-102 to a ton. So they are soon to release the wider angle zoom for that. 
I love the Optimos just all around. Like the Super 35 Optimos are hard to beat. You know, I would kind of like, like I was on a shoot uh, with Dolly Parton and Garth Brooks and ACAM had an Optimo, you know, the Optimos are all these weird, like 57 to like 117 or something like that. So I forget which exact uh, Optimo Zoom I was on, but it was the Super 35 Optimo Zooms and then had a Cook S4 Prime on Bcam. So I was looking at them side by side and the Optimo outperformed, the Optimo Zoom outperformed the Cook S4 Prime in all aspects. Um, I mean, I know that that's subjective, right? Like outperforming, it depends on what you want. But in terms of like, the Cook S4 was washed out because we were doing heavy backlight. So it was washed out. There was no contrast. The colors were muddy, like overly warm. And the Optimo just like retained everything. Like it was pleasing sharpness. There was contrast. There was color separation. And I was just like, man, uh, you know, again, like I don't, I'm not hesitant to shoot on an Optimo zoom compared to a prime just because it's a prime like that those optimo zooms can look amazing and still give you everything you want so mm, good answer yeah so we have uh, oh, cook anamorphics cook, cook anamorphics yeah. <laughs> well sure your, your shopping well, list is might huge as well throw them in there yeah your, your shopping list is absolutely huge it's it, there's always something in the back of the mind and then Clint comes out with something else and then I shift because they're coming out with the, the Canoptic 9.8 millimeter rehoused by zero optic. And I mean, like, like I love GL. I love all the rehousing companies, but like, I really would like more stuff from zero optic just because Alex is like the best dude. He and I have been friends since he kind of like, was getting zero off the ground. And mm -hmm. so we've talked like business stuff and his company's just like exploded. He's like the best person, you know, one of the few American companies doing, you know, in intense stuff. Um, mm -hmm. It's like, I was visiting Alex when I was first wanting to get my rangefinder set rehoused. And then I got to see the lenses that he was rehousing for Zack Schneider. Mm -hmm. and it's just like they're doing s such cool stuff um yeah just because they're you know they're in that world like they're yeah in, they're in yeah. la and burbank or whatever yeah yeah we absolutely love alex and we love zero optic and i personally uh just always look at zero optic and alex's designs as inspiration for yeah uh the stuff that we do yeah. you know, with iron glass, you know, just the visual side of it, just how pretty those lenses are, you know, always take that as, as an inspiration, you know, yeah. that's, that's where you need to be if you want to, you want to be yeah. great. So yeah, right. absolutely. Style with you. To it as well. Yeah. Yeah. So here's a question from uh, Martin here uh, from uh, ATM rental in, in Poland. They have a huge lineup as well. I should probably get Martin to, to chat with me one day. Awesome. Uh, he's asking, what what do we think about, or what do you think about uh, creating lenses out of a basic set, you know, like uh, Canon RF or what uh, GL did with uh, Mami 18, you know, where you add additional elements to create additional focal lengths. Well, how, how do you rate those lenses? Yeah, I mean, especially with the FD set, like I was planning to, you know, expand the set and turn uh, the 24 um, a spherical into an 18. Like, it's pretty exciting. Um, I think I think that's really cool. I'm I'm a little more hesitant for companies that are like creating almost an FD from like other optics and then adding it to a set and like calling it an FD. Like some of that stuff just gets a little too creative for my taste. Um, but that's also about the market we're in. Like we're in Nashville and it's not a lot of feature films. So when people are taking out sets, a lot of times DPs are fine with like a fairly intentional and selective like five or six lens set. They're not looking for like a 20 lens set where they need everything accomplished, you know, for a four month feature film or something like that or series. So it's, it's just 
di- people demand different things. So we're, we're just like meeting a specific demand. But um, I mean, I liked when TLS added the speed boosters, like that was cool, like made the lenses faster, but it still retained like their uh, original character. What did they do with the 18? Is what there's the 24 fisheye, which becomes a 17. Yeah. Is that what um, we're talking uh, about? I think it's, um, no? I don't remember. I think it's a tighter focal length that has the the uh, wide angle adapter on the front. So it's the next okay. next one up, non okay. non-fisheye. Okay. That, it just that like fills the in angle. the gaps. Yeah. Yeah. That, that, that's as far as I know from just chatting to someone. Um, not... 35 is the widest. Cool. Cool. Not and yeah, first time I mean, experience. in my understanding, and Clint can jump in, but in my understanding, the Pets Velux set can have so many different um, focal lengths because of things like that, like where it starts with, you know, certain optics, and then you build from there, getting tighter and wider. Um, and then, you know, because, yeah, so, um, yeah, that's, that's a way to get creative, like, I recently found a company that had four cook 20 to sixties. And so I, I just recently bought the cook 10 to 30 for 16 millimeter. Cause we've got a couple six, we got an SR three and a, that's on a minima for film. And, um, and then it's, it's basically the same lens. I think with some different optics on the back, it turns it into a 20 to 60 and then a rental house in LA had four of those. So they added like a 1.4 times extender and called it like a 35 to something and then added a two times extender and called it like a, you know, 40 to 120. And then they added a wide angle adapter and called it like, you know, so it's like, all right, now you have a vintage set of super 35 cook Vero Pancro zooms Mm -hmm. and you can do multi-cam with them. I don't know. It's a little overboard. And, And also the way it was marketed, like, the lenses were marketed as those focal lengths. They weren't marketed as like Cook Vero Pancro or Cook Speed Pancro zooms. It was like, you know, the millimeters were lenses I'd never seen. And I was like, oh, Cook made these wide angle Pancro zooms back in the day. It's like, no, they didn't make those. Somebody just added like a two times extender to the back, you know? So I feel like just be honest about what you're doing Mm-hmm. don't you know don't mm-hmm. try and mm-hmm. and like like zero optic dude they're honest you know they they test how much light is actually going through a lens and they put the real t-stop on the lens and alex said they've really like pissed some people off because um you know you, you get a dream lens back and it says you know t 1.2 or something instead of f.95 mm-hmm. and that and and that bigger number isn't as sexy yes and so what it's like be honest like yeah. sorry yes yeah. yes yes uh again zero optic is it's the the top of the precision in in that yeah. sense as well which is again very inspirational yeah because um, other companies will flub it you know a little bit well um i've seen some really huge companies outside of the general rehousing world that mm-hmm. You know, you know, certain rentals that, you know, make their own series, uh, you, know, yeah. you know, huge, huge rentals without naming any names and they just do whatever right. they want. They don't, they will just, they will just put F stop on there if they want, you know, they, they don't right. care. So, right. so, uh, yeah, it's, um, and hey, I understand like- why, I understand why rentals sometimes will, you know, that, sure. that open stop can be, can be very, <laughs> all over all over the place right <laughs> far from the it's truth like, it's like the price goes up the lower that stop right exactly yes i i think when in this in the, um, my personal opinion with this stuff as far as the photo sets that are all over the place generally anyway uh, uh, apart from maybe olympus om you generally have just you know something like like our set or soviet set it's just all over the place. It starts really mm-hmm. slow, then it speeds up in the middle and goes slow again. Mm-hmm. Um, you can never really have, you can never really even them out in any way. Uh, right. Anyway, so that, that first stop is almost, it is what it is. Mm-hmm. To me, it's when they meet at a similar stop. That's where I, 
that's the way precision really needs to be. You know, so once yeah. you stop all of them to four, all of them, then to me, it's very important that then they really match really well. Because yeah. wide open, they're just going to be what they're going to be. You won't be able to make them faster by writing that they're faster or writing that they're a bit slower. If they don't match, you know, you're just either going to use them as they are wide open and just get mm -hmm. what you get, or you're going to try to put them to the next stop that is equal. Right. And then right. at that point, you want to you want them to be really well matched. You yeah. know, that's, that's, yeah, that's how... I mean, I see. There's a reason the accuracy is there. It's like if you have multiple cameras and you're matching stops, like, yeah, you need to be able to match stops, right? Like that should be precise. Yes, even even with um, even with yeah. a single camera jumping from one focal length to another, and you just want to put the uh, same stop on, and you know you wanna you wanna be sure that your brightness levels have not changed, and just in both you have less trouble to deal with. Yeah, that's that's a good comment right now that the TLS updated both the focal length and the T-stop after the speed boosters added. Yeah. Which that's, is which is correct way to do right. it for sure. Yeah. Right. For sure. It also makes lenses more attractive as far as T-stop goes. So why True. why not? True. <laughs> right. Um, yeah, cuz like well, the so, movies are already fast for medium format lenses. Yeah. You know, 28 two medium format world is like really fast. Mm. But and, mm. well and then 2 on, because the 90 is f2 i think which is insane in medium format lens. yeah um, yeah and we also had a confirmation from both ilko uh here and and martin here about about what lens was was that mamiya made from okay. it was the 35 with a speed booster and adapter oh wow so it's a bit of it's impressive it's a bit of both to to make that wow. focal length that that's probably a first that I've heard of something like that. Both yeah. tools used to create a new focal length. Huh. Yeah. That's so creative. It is. It is. is yeah. You know. So I guess sometimes it needs to be done with those vintage lenses. You just there's no way to get your focal length otherwise, and you know that's yeah. why it, be it has become so popular. Um, uh, Martin says he has it in Poland. So if. If uh, Nathan, you end up in Poland, <laughs> you know you know where to find that lens and That'd check so it fun. out. Uh, so we've all run by half an hour now, pretty much. Uh, it's time to wrap up. Um, cool. <laughs> so I'm gonna give you one last question. If you could only have one lens for the rest of your life, what would it be? Hmm. We're gonna need another thirty minutes for me to just like talk <laughs> through this. And... Well, imagine you, people said, uh, you know, deserted islands. Well, no, in <laughs> real in real life, just you just have one lens to use. Which one would you use? Okay. So I think I'm gonna go practical on this one. Hmm. Well, well, I th I think I think I would go cook twenty to cook Vero Pancro twenty to sixty. Mm -hmm. Um, because other other than the rangefinders, I probably should have said cook speed Pancros as my as my favorite lens set. Honestly, like if I'm taking the approach that you took, which was like you know this lens set had like an impact on me, it was cook speed Pancros that like were my first love for a set of cinema lenses. And I picked every single prime myself. It took like maybe six months or a year, you know, to find them right. And then at that time I could only afford to rehouse one at a time. So I would ship it off to Germany to PS Technic and then I'd get one and then I'd ship another one and save up some more money. And so that was when it was like, you know, self-sacrifice and then, and then the, and then the set was built and it was like, I shot my first short film with them. So I could probably rescind that and say Cook Speed Pancros, but like the the series two, series three Cook Speed Pancro look is insane. Yeah. You know, it like I mean, watching that old video of Joe Dutton talk about Stanley Kubrick's favorite lenses, in addition to you, uh, that was the most influential uh, video that mm. sort of sent me in a direction of like. These are cool lenses. 
to yeah. explore. Yeah. It had the Ingenue 25 to 250 in it, and they did all sorts of funky optics with it. You know, that had, I think, like the 18 millimeter Cook Speed Pancro had the Canoptic 9.8 millimeter um, super wide angle lens. Um, so the Cook 20 to 60 is like actually a very recent acquisition. Uh, it is an Academy 35 lens, which needs to be adapted to super 35 so we've got we now just got like the adapter f uh for that um so yeah it, w it would be the cook 20 to 60 because i could get i could still be like quick on my feet get a variety of um you know get a variety of like focal ranges and then still have that like built-in cook speed pancro look Mm -hmm. So, so you, you managed to get away from the question of just one lens and you ended up saying Cook Spin Pycros, the whole set, I need the whole set. <laughs> well, and you still no, love them the, to this the day. Cook, the Cook 20 to 60. Yeah. Okay. Okay. I'd say because because it has the Pancro look yeah. in a zoom format. Yeah. It's fascinating that you've had so many lenses added to your inventory and you know being able to access those lenses for your shoot since you've acquired those Cooksby Pankers, because even when we met, that was so many years ago, and you've already oh, had totally. them by then. Oh, totally, so, yeah. So, so like one of the early. first lenses almost, and you st still think they're your favorites, which is yeah, but fascinating. Yeah, I gotta I be honest, that. kind of similar to the to the Soviet Primes, like I don't use them like that, mm -hmm. but I aspire to. I just but whenever it. you do, every time you do, you just fall in love. Yeah, I I'm guess. like, oh, I'm like, oh, that's why. Yeah, They're magic. absolutely. Absolutely. I agree with you. I agree with you for sure. 100%. Right. So absolute pleasure, uh, Nathan. For, yeah, same. You know, just a massive nerd out, uh, <laughs> <laughs> which is what it was supposed to be. Uh, <laughs> and, you know, some great comments from you guys. Uh, thanks for everyone joining in. Yeah, thanks um, everybody. Everyone, if you're watching on Facebook, please subscribe to make sure you don't miss next time because it's just so easy to miss these conversations and they're most fun when they're live, I think. Uh, so what I want to say is absolute massive thank you to Nathan for joining me today. You know, absolutely loved it. What a great way to spend uh, a Sunday evening for me and Sunday morning for you, hopefully. Mm -hmm. um, and everyone else who joined us today, thank you. And we will see you again in the next one. Thanks, right. Alan. Bye. All right.